Diamond Dutch. shoulder by Snowden of the Triangle Y, they recuperating from his hurt, and fearing he was going to die, gave away all his worldly possessions, his horse, his saddle, his gun, his knife, and what all. And then, fate being up to one of its tricks, Bobby got well, and his horse and saddle and all were gone. Meantime, the men of the outfit started out, led by Dell and four Texas Rangers, to trap Snowden in Porcupine Pass. The plan was for all the men, save Darrow and Shorty, to wait for Snowden at the mouth of the pass, while Shorty and Darrow lowered themselves over the cliff at the other end and came on Snowden from the rear. And that was where we left the situation. And out the space after the men rode out from the Diamond Decks, here's Miss Mary Harrison, who stayed behind with the Chinaman cook, Wong Yi, and her small brother and her father, sitting with her father, who, as always is the case, He's lying paralyzed on his bed in the ranch house. I never saw the time go so slowly. Seems like hours we say from God. Mary. Mary, what in heck are you doing over there at the window? Staring and just staring. Something you want, Dad? I said, what are you staring at? Nothing, Dad. What do you want? There's nothing I want. The wall fired quiet around here. It gives me the willies. <laughs> You'd like me to do some pounding on the wash tub to liven things up. Mm. I like things happening around me. All the men chasing across the country after that no count Snowden. Mm. Give me a glass of water. Yes, sir. Thanks. Uh. Mm. Where's Bobby? Asleep. The excitement was too much for him. The fever's up again. Probably will break before morning. Mm, what that youngster needs a good lamb basting. Then he wouldn't always be getting in trouble. What's the matter with you anyway? Quit saying that and asking questions, will you, Dad? There's nothing the matter with me. You keep staring out the window. Do I? And when anybody says anything to you, you snap them up like a turtle. You feeling all right? Sure, I'm feeling all right. Why shouldn't I be? I guess you think I'm a fool, my girl, don't you? No, of course not. Well, I'm not. I'm not so blind as you figure me to be. Just what are you getting at, Dad? Hmm. I ain't as dumb as you think I am. Dad, if there's nothing you want, I've got work to do. Now, don't go rushing off. No need of it. What you've got to do will keep. And it ain't that dough, is it? What are you talking about? What am I talking about? I know what I'm talking about. Well... If it's Daryl and you want to marry him, go ahead. Stop it. I've been able to give you most of the things you want. And if you want that cow, man. <laughs> you're an old dear. But I guess I won't get married. I'm cut out to be an old maid, and an old maid I'll die. Mm. You with your good looks and all. Just a nonsense. Oh, no, it is. It is. There's no use paying me compliments. Leave that to those who have less brains than you. He's a strong, well-put-together figure of a man, all right. Who is? John Darrow. Dad, Harrison, if you don't cut that out, I'm going to treat you just like I treat Bobby. Why, you old good-for-nothing reprobate, I... I... Well, I mean it. I do. A man of your age acting that way. Now, what's Wong Lee doing out there? Hey there, Wong Lee. What's going on out there? Most like Bobby's got into his biscuit box or something of the kind. I told you, Bobby's asleep. It's something else, and I'm going to find out what it is. What's the matter, Wong Lee? Oh, crazy man, calm. What are you talking about? Oh, him crazy man, calm. I better go out and see what it's all about there. All right, 
wrong with you? What is it? Oh, a crazy man come. Him riding donkey. Who's riding a donkey? Crazy man. Me not know who. I don't know what you're talking about, Wong Lee. Oh, yes, but say, me not know. Now start at the beginning and tell me what this is all about. A crazy man come. Him ride donkey. Him talky, talky, talky. A Wong Lee no sabe. You don't know who he is? I mean, not that big. I'm crazy. Where is he? I'm by hot stop. He let me crazy. All right, you go on back to the checkout. I'll find out for myself. All the time, the time, the time. Well, what can I do for you? Madam, my trust I do not intrude. My noble steed has carried me far. We are weary and worn out and pain would rest. Mm-hmm. What is it? Where are you from? From yonder, madam, where the blue sky touches the far horizon. That's pretty indefinite. What's your name? William Shakespeare, madam, at your service. What? William Shakespeare, the bard of the prairie. I see. I- I've heard the name before. An honorable and honored name, madam. One of the world has long delighted to honor. Years, eh, centuries before I came upon this earth, there was another William Shakespeare. Uh, doubtless you've heard of him. I think so. A great poet and a great student of mankind. A man whose words were gentle music. But we will not speak of that. Now, I only ask the privilege of shaking down a bed for myself in a straw and making me friend and companion, my burro, comfortable. Then if perchance I could borrow uh, perhaps a slice of bacon if you coffee beans. I think that can be arranged. Thank you, madam. I've traveled far and traveled long. I've always found that the door of Ranch House is open to me and a friendly greeting for me and uh, Polonius. We try to be friendly. And friendliness is a noble virtue. Polonius, you will stand at ease and presently your wants will be ministered to. The donkey's name is Polonius? So I have named the steed. But uh, before I depart from your hospitable acres, I shall deem it an honor to present you with a copy of the sonnet I have written to Polonius. You really are a poet. A poor poet, but a poet nonetheless. My dear departed mother, the Lord cherished for soul, found inspiration before I was born in the dreams of the immortal Shakespeare. So when I was born to this life of mortal soil, the good woman passed the name and the perchance the heritage on to me. William Shakespeare Hawkins. The Hawkins I have discarded. But the inspiration remains in me blood and even as he created drama in his noble fashion. So I scribble verse in my humble way. That's very interesting. And now, Mr. Hawkins... Uh, Shakespeare, I... Shakespeare, madam. Mr. Shakespeare, I will see what we can find you to eat. Oh, pray do not discommode yourself. A slice of bacon, a few coffee beans to brew. You want for simple. I ask no more. And for what I receive... I'm able to pay. Oh, that'll not be necessary. You're welcome to what we've got. Ah, but I stand upon my dignity. I pay as I go, and am beholden for no man. See, uh, I have gold. What in the world have you got there? Priceless yellow dust. Gold dust? Gold, madam. Precious gold from the bowels of the earth. And when this is gone, there are vast treasures still to be taken from Mother Earth. Oh, the land is rich. With gold. Yes, yes, I know all that, but where did you get it? Yonder, madam, where the sky comes down to meet the rolling hills. There in the mountain pass, Miss Polonius and I make our home. There we find gold with which to purchase the bread and wine necessary to our sustenance. There Just we... a minute. Yes. Wong? Wong Lee? Oh, hello, you are. He left some of that beef stew we had for chow. Put a pot of coffee on the fire. If there's any more of that apple pie, heat it up, too. Put your gold back in your pocket, Mr. Shakespeare. Uh, there's a bucket if you want to water your burl. Thank you, madam. Polonius thanks you through me, for surely there is no creature on earth more noble than the man, uh, or woman, who gives a thought to the wants of dumb animals. This is true compassion. There you are, Polonius. Drink deeply of this celestial nectar. You fine creature, you. Uh, did you, uh, uh, madam? Did you really find a vein of gold over there in the deep? We have found many veins of gold. Wherever we travel, we find gold. 
Having satisfied the inner man, I shall happily make a map for you of the place where it is to be found. No, I wouldn't do that. If you've located a vein, the sooner you go in the upper center and file your claim, the better. We file no claims, lady. The wealth of the land belongs to all men. I have taken all that Polonius and I need for today and tomorrow. The next day will take care of itself. Didn't you say you're not going to take your claim? Gold is only good for the immediate need to be satisfied. He who hoards gold hoards trouble and sorrow. Our path leads away from the butte. We will not return. You must be crazy. Men have called William Shakespeare mad ere this. But in my philosophy, madness is only a matter of degree. And what may seem madness to one is wisdom to another. If it be madness to scorn gold, then, in very truth, both Polonius and I are mad. And Polonius, the matter of the two. For I take what gold I require, but Polonius scorns it all. Ah, there, Polonius, you've drunk enough. First, half satisfied in life. Keep hope alive. What do you say, Fair? Or Hawkins, or whatever your name is? William Shakespeare, madam. She's a simple name to remember. Well, William, since you don't intend to go back to your claim... It is not mine, madam. It belongs to all men. No, I won't argue that now. As long as you're not interested in it yourself. Do you think you could lead my men to where you uncovered the ledge? I can, but I warn you again. Solemnly, I warn you. What do you mean? They will find gold, and gold brings evil in its way. We will gamble on that. Will you show my men the way? I will. I guess Longley was right. You're crazy. I'll go into the chuck house and eat. No doubt the stew is hot by now. <laughs> That was the way new character came drifting into the diamond X. As you might surmise, his coming was to have plenty of effect on the lot of us before we were to see the last of him. Meanwhile, the men of the diamond X were traveling in the direction of Porcupine, all but Darrow and Shorty D. Those two heading west, calculating to come to the top of Porcupine Cliffs from the rear. It was the rest of the men were concerned now as we pick them up at the entrance to the pass. He didn't know just where in the past Norton had hit out. And as you can well figure, we were traveling light and quiet. I figure this is about far enough. So I shouldn't wonder. That shot the range over the horse's head to walk in from here. Whoa! Who stands here then? Maybe you'd best stay with the horses, Peggy. They'll be strictly up against it if they go staring off in the dark. Ain't not me. There ain't no horse herder. If there's going to be any action, Pinky Jones aims to be where the action is. Our best do as he says, Pinky. Somebody's got to. Well, I ain't no nurse girl. Give it a powerful stand of yours, Will. Yeah. They're likely to begin kicking up their heels if they hear some gunfire. Well, these Texas ponies are used to it. I often just be light uh, and decide what to do next. Me, I'd like to light and bury my face in some more warm leaves, too. I'm hungry. You're always hungry since there ain't nothing to being cold. Go climb a tree and you'll get warm. That's right, man. <laughs> How far is it to the mouth of the pass? Well, I figure about a quarter of a mile. Winds into those rocks yonder and swings to left. Uh, think we can make it without being seen? I reckon. But you know more about this country than I do. Uh, come on over, men. Take a load off your feet. Well, I, I reckon we'd best uh, take the rigging off our horses. I ain't leaving the leather on the ground, not to be trampled underfoot. You can't never tell. We may have to do some quick riding when we come back. You're right for once in your life, Pinky. I usually am, most of the time. Well, let that be. You've been through the pass a lot. See if you can give us a picture of it. And that's what comes of travel and section. Ah, uh, none of that. What do you say? About uh, half a mile off? Yeah. And that means we've got to do some mighty quiet traveling uh, until we come up with snow. Oh, somebody put a muzzle on that horse. The uh, edge of your horses are. Uh, a sense of something's going to happen. <laughs> and no one be. Horses sure are. I remember when... This is no time for remembering, brother. Uh, go on with what you were saying about the pass. Well, yep. It takes a turn a few hundred feet in. It makes a sharp curve. I like the crotch of a queen shot. Yeah. And that's likely where Snowden pulled in. Like it. You can wager your last dollar on it. You can be so well hidden in there, you're not likely to see him till you come right on him. 
And right there, the cliff rises for maybe 500 feet. You could light a campfire in there. It wouldn't show no glow and not even any smoke if you come on it. And that's where Darrell and Shorty plan to come down. Yes, and take their lives in their hands. It's all taking a chance. Well, what makes you say that, Pinky? One place about better than the other. Only this one's worse. There's places there where the cliffs lean in instead of out. If they figure to lower their sails by ropes, they'll just be dangling in the air with nothing but rocks beneath them and sky above them. Not even able to touch the face of the cliff. If you ask me, I call it murder. Ah, uh, Dow knows what he's doing. Patterson, you and your men have your guns ready. Carter, you get that length of rope from your saddle. When we come on Snowden, we may have to tie him up or something. Yeah, there's something likely being hanging. Yeah, and there's not going to be any hanging. Now, look, men, we got everything set in your mind? Yeah. Yeah. We go into the pass as soon as we get Daryl's signal. Now, Dow will fire his gun as soon as he's down from the cliff. That'll get Snowden started. Either Snowden will go back to the further end of the pass to investigate, and we'll close in on him from the rear and front. Oh, well, what's more like? He'd get scared and come out this end and walk right into our hands. In which case, we'll likely put a hunk of lead in him before he gets to it. Oh, keep your voice down. You talk too much, John. Mm, we was just speaking. Well, don't think so loud. Shut up with him. Carter, you stick with Pinky. Keep to the rear, so if he makes a break past the other four of us, you can have him covered. I figure we should ought to be hearing from Darrow, Connor. Well, I guess it ain't too easy to come down and face that cliff. There's another thing. Huh? How do you know we can hear Darrow's gun out here when he does shoot it? We'll hear it, no question. Firing the gun down in the blind end of that pass, it'll echo like shooting a cannon in a steam boiler. Oh, he's right there. That's about the first time in your life you have been right, Pete. Yeah, thanks, brother, thanks. Oh, don't mention it. Come on, let's get going. We might as well get as close to the entrance of the pass as we can so we can cut right in when the signal comes. Let's go. You sit for me, Carter. Listen, you and Jones are rest too close in our heels. You're okay. And keep your hands on your shooting irons all the time. Right, guy. And no talking. Come on. Go ahead. There isn't more 
to it now, is he? Yeah, just now. Look. Just back up. Come on, Shorty, you spill it. You got it in your mind. I tell you nothing, Darrell. Only I shouldn't wonder if maybe there was an attraction to make you figure you'd like to stick the diamond ass out there. Yes, yeah, that's right. Yeah, plenty. There's not a lot of men in the town when you go. Good cattle and good horses and men to bad grazing, man. And the club's good and the hairs must treat them in proper. All in all, it's pretty good bunk, Shorty. That's all there is to it, huh, Long John? You know, Shorty, if I'm not mistaken, there's a cloud of dust moving in now across the flat. I shouldn't wonder if that was Patterson all night. He's about time. You ain't answering my question, are you, Dal? I can't say I rightly can figure this. What's your head now, Shorty? No? No. It's all done as I can. Oh, well, I was just figuring maybe you might be figuring this Mary is reason enough for sticking to the ranch. You know, that's them all right, Shorty. I can make out the horses now. I see you, Sam. John, why is he getting this Mary to marry you? You want that I should drop you over the cliff. Shut your mouth, Shorty. You, you get the most all fine local ideas and that empty head of yours. Come on. We best get started. There's plenty of time. We you starting down and we know the men are at the pass. Why don't you, Long John? Why don't I what? Get Miss Mary to marry you. Look here, Bean. I ain't interested in women. I ain't interested in getting married and that's a fact. Now, what do you think of that? I think you're a dang busted liar. <laughs> when I got nothing else to do, no business to attend to, Maybe I'll stuff them words down your throat. That'll be nice. Meanwhile, why don't you marry her? Shorty, this is one heck of a time to be talking about things like that. We got business to do. Yeah, we might as well be talking while we're waiting for the business to start. Seems like you're doing a lot of stalling down. Yes, I guess I am. I guess, Shorty, you can't quite figure how I feel about the situation. Sometimes I'm not sure how I'm thinking myself. <laughs> Sometimes I'm kind of scared. This I will say. There never was a woman on this earth any finer than this man. Right, there's millions of not like this man. There never was another like it. But I ain't feeling like that. She wouldn't fight me. What I feel about her, that's my business. And she or nobody else may stop me feeling the way I do. Now, what you laughing at? <laughs> Just thinking, John. There ain't been a thing I've been able to think of. You'd be fair to me. You'd ride any horse, fight any man or any lot of men, go any place, do most anything. But one girl got you to <laughs> Well, it's for that. Huh? It's for that. What? Now, cut out the jab when you get busy. The horses will stop down there, and the men are foot and starting for the pack. Can you make out any of them? Yeah. Too dark to make out anything. Nothing but shadows now. It'll be black in another few minutes. Come on, Shorty. Look out. You don't break your neck stumbling over the edge of the cliff. I'll take care of my own neck. Come on. Yeah. i tell you what we do, Long John. Yep. Yeah, now you lower me by the rope. I figure it's long enough to reach the bottom of the cliff. If I get down all right, I'll jerk the rope. That'll be a signal for you to slide down it. How's that idea strike you? Most of it's all right, Shorty. Oh, but one thing. What? I'm going down first. You'll follow. Now, look here, Shorty, Darryl. don't start arguing. We have work to do. This part of the party I'm running. I guess I make myself clear, don't I? I reckon I'm following you. Yes, and you follow me down the rope. There's no use me just sliding down it. I'm likely to get about 50 feet from the floor of the coolie and find I got a long drop ahead of me. The only thing to do is this. I'm listening. Now, wait till I get a good hitch of the rope around my waist. There. That'll hold out longer than you and I can. Now, when I give the word, you start lowering me. Even a good fight around the stump. Low way slow. When I get down, I'll fire my gun. I'll be a signal for our men to start in, a signal for you to slide down. What if the rope ain't long enough? If it ain't, I'll give some yanks on it. You'll be able to feel it. Then you got to try to pull me up again. 
Maybe you'll have to make the rope fast and get one of the horses and let him pull me up. One way or other, that's the picture. If I shoot my gun, you slide down. If I yank the rope, you pull me up. I get a good bite around the cactus. I got it. Can you see our men anymore? It's so dark, I can hardly see you. You better start rolling, Cody. Yeah. Hey, Daryl. Yeah? If you fall and break your neck, I won't go back and tell Miss Mary anything about your being afraid of asking her to marry you. <laughs> you know, Shorty, I always figured I ought to keep a little notebook. Yeah? And write down all the things I got to take out of your hide one time or another. Ever so often you need and want a good licking, and I'm the one to give it to you. <laughs> all right, Long John, let's call it quiz. Job again, Lauren? Now wait till I find an edge of the cliff where the rock isn't likely to cut the rope. Yeah, this will do. Got a good hold? Yep. I got one turn around the waist, and with each other around the tree, everything's going to work pretty. Can you see where you're going? Up to now. All right, Cody. Get out a little. Yeah. How's that? That's good. Just get out slow, Cody. Rope cutting you, John? Nope. You're going to be Can you see where you're heading? No. Don't make me talk unless I got you. You okay, Long John? I'm all right. All right, Daryl. All right, Cody. All right, Daryl. Are you all right, Daryl? Hey, Long John. Long John, are you all right? Hey, John. John Winehead, don't you answer? Are you all right? the 13th episode of Daryl of the Diamond X, written and directed by Samuel Dixon. Listen to the 14th episode next Friday night at 8.30. Tonight's cast of NBC players included Jack Cahill as Pinky Jones and Mr. Harrison, Jerry Walter as Shorty Bean, Henry Lapp as Wong Lee, Mary Barnett as Mary Harrison, John Grover as William Shakespeare Hawkins, and Kurt Martell as John Darrell. Music was arranged and directed by Tony Freeman. Sound effects were created by... chips went down, or who pulled a bonehead play to lose a World Series. But before I tell you tonight's story, I have a message for you. You may remember that on this program, I've occasionally talked about the future of young men. I have because I've been through the mill myself. I know the great importance of deciding right at the beginning of your career exactly where you're going. When you're dreaming of your future, picture yourself streaking across the sky in a sleek jet fire.
And now, for the first time on the air, RKO presents The Jungle Adventures of Frank Buck. Terror in the night. Superstitious folks the world around people the night with legendary horrors. Creatures human by day which turn themselves to beasts at sundown. To range the dark, playing on their fellows. In southern Europe, these are the vampires, the undead who sleep in their graves by day to fly the night as fast seeking human blood, without which they must perish. In northern Europe, since wolves are the most ferocious beasts in the woods of the north, these supernatural beings of the night are called werewolves. And as darkness comes, fearful wayfarers wonder if their neighbors will suddenly turn to wolves. And so in the jungles of the Malay Peninsula, where I filmed the motion picture Bring Them Back Alive, these creatures of terror, human by day, beast by night, are the were-tigers. For the tiger is the great killer of the jungle, and the words hurry move, the jar, enormous tiger, strike fear to every native heart. This is the story of the were tiger of Sung Gai and the drums. It's the drums that pounded out a rhythm of doom as the slow jungle day crept on toward the sudden jungle night, and the minutes were crammed with suspense, ticking away like the last heartbeat of a human being destined for a horrible death. I first heard of the ghost tiger from a young couple whom I shall call Charles and Mary Ransom. I had orders from many animals for zoos and circuses in the United States, and I had set up my jungle camp near some guy. Usually, my camp is far from any sign of civilization, so when I found there was an isolated rubber plantation a mile or so away, I was delighted that I went to call. I found the Ransom charming people. Mary was young and pretty, weak as they arrived. Charles had been there some 